Maxwell Jacob Friedman, MJF, is one of AEW's biggest and brightest stars and he has distinguished himself from everybody in the wrestling industry through his impeccable mic work and his impudent, audacious, despicable, bastard, loathsome, obnoxious, detestable, reprehensible, piece of sh bully-like character. <sighs> There truly aren't enough adjectives in the English language to describe how vile MJF truly is. But this is exactly what makes him arguably the best bad guy in wrestling, a massive TV draw, and quite honestly, the future of wrestling in general. And it's insane that he's only 25, cause not too long ago he was auditioning for WWE's Tough Enough competition. Tony Khan of AEW must have been very glad to have gotten his hands on MJF. And you'd think that all of MJF's worst traits and characteristics are all just an act because he's playing as a bad guy, right? Wrong. Even long before AEW, MJF was an a-hole and when he got to AEW, that just multiplied even further. From his peers to the fans, genuinely nobody likes MJF as a human being. From him ripping on disabled people, to him disrespecting interviewers, to him not crediting artists for using their work, to him getting kicked off of Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast for being rude to Stone Cold, to him pointing the middle finger at a child, to him ripping the signs of fans at shows, to him throwing his gum in fans' faces, to him verbally assaulting paying fans on Cameo, to him stealing the caps of fans in the crowd and throwing them as far as possible, and much, much more. Clearly, MJF is a pretty bad guy and is quite literally a menace. Even his parents expressed that they didn't like him and this is what he said in response. So here's the thing about my mom. She's a dumb, disgusting slut. My father is an old, irrelevant, worthless piece of shit. MJF wakes up every day and he chooses violence with his words. MJF doesn't just blur the line between fiction and reality. There is no line with MJF, as he does what he wants, when he wants. MJF constantly pushes the envelope and in this way he makes himself relevant and you just can't take your eyes off of him. And MJF doesn't have an off switch, as he's not a character. MJF is just MJF. And that's why wrestling legends and many of his industry counterparts and a lot of fans have such high praise for him, saying that he's reminiscent of a throwback heel. MJF also has a way with words that is truly remarkable and this was evident when he cut his very first promo in front of the AEW fans at AEW's Double or Nothing 2019. Sometimes you see a wrestler for the very first time and you know that they're the real deal and they have the it factor. And that's how it was with MJF, as MJF was a heat magnet from day one in AEW as he roasted Hangman page, the fans, and even disrespected the great Bret Hitman Hart. And then he let out one of his classic bastard heel smiles. That damn smile. So you see, that's where the trouble began. That smile. That damn smile. MJF is a master maestro with his words and he plays the crowd like a violin as his promos have a perfect balance of aggressiveness, quick wit, savagery and excellent comedic timing. MJF showed off this talent further at AEW's next pay per view, Fighter Fest 2019, in which he said this to the fans who were chanting, you suck at MJF. That mother of yours whose basement you live in, she swallows, so. You know when you're leaving people like this in utter contempt for you, then you must be doing something right. And his talent on the mic translated into the ring as he won the Dynamite Diamond Ring after beating Hangman Adam Page in a seven minute match. Cody Rhodes was the one who brought MJF to AEW as he saw something special in him at an independent show and he decided to sign him to AEW. Cody Rhodes took MJF under his wing in AEW and they were buddies as they were together a lot. It was quite interesting because Cody was one of the most beloved baby faces and he was very close to the most dastardly heel around and this made MJF sort of half heel and half face but he was a perfect wolf in sheep's clothing. MJF was nice to everyone only when Cody Rose was around but as soon as Cody left he turned back into a demon endlessly hurling insults at whoever he could. Everybody told Cody that MJF was no good but Cody didn't listen and he continued to be friends with MJF but everybody knew that it was only a matter of time before MJF's true colors show and MJF backed Cody up in Cody's feud with Sean Spears and at AEW's All Out 2019, Cody Rhodes faced off against Sean Spears with MJF in Cody's corner and Tully Blanchard in Sean Spears' corner and Cody picked up the win but after Cody picked up the win, MJF grabbed the chair that was in the ring and for a second, it looked like MJF was about to hit Cody with the chair and prove everybody's assumptions about him to be true but then he threw the chair to the side and he embraced Cody in an effort to prove that he was actually a good guy. Cody and MJF's close friendship was continued as Cody Rhodes 
Rhodes got into a feud with Chris Jericho, who was the AEW's world champion at the time. And at AEW's full gear, Cody and Chris Jericho's feud culminated. And the stakes were high in this match as the stipulation going into it was that if Cody Rhodes lost, he would never be able to challenge for the AEW world championship again. And towards the end of the match, Cody was stuck in Chris Jericho's lion tamer. And in a moment that seemed like it was calculated from the start, MJF threw in the towel on the behalf of Cody Rhodes. And this effectively meant that Cody Rhodes forfeited the match and he was never going to be able to challenge for the AEW world championship again. And this left the bloody Cody visibly upset as MJF was on his knees crying to Cody saying that he was sorry for letting Cody down. And just as Cody was about to forgive MJF, MJF kicked him in the nuts and then he let out one of his classic bastard heel smiles. Seriously though, MJF has such a punchable face and when he was walking up the ramp to go backstage, a fan threw his drink at MJF. If that isn't heat then I don't know what is. It didn't really matter that we saw MJF turning on Cody from a mile away because they told an effective story in the process and on the dynamite after full gear, Chris Jericho offered MJF a spot in the inner circle which was met with some interest and some resistance from MJF but this segment showed the chemistry between Chris Jericho and MJF was off the charts. There's so much more to the story with Chris Jericho down the line so remember this interaction for later down the line and don't forget to leave a like on the video and subscribe if you haven't. But anyway, as MJF and Chris Jericho were marveling in their bromance, Cody Rhodes came out to confront Chris Jericho and MJF but then the 6 foot 2, 277 pound beast Wardlow debuted and he took out Cody Rhodes. And from this point on, Wardlow is MJF's right hand man. MJF said that he is never going to wrestle Cody. But Cody Rhodes was so pissed off about the trail that he was so determined to wrestle MJF so he told MJF to name his price and MJF said that he would face Cody Rhodes at AEW's Revolution 2020 on three conditions. The first condition was that Cody Rhodes could not touch MJF until Revolution but this didn't mean other members couldn't touch MJF on the behalf of Cody Rhodes. And on Jericho's Rock and Rager cruise, the Young Bucks threw MJF into a pool and this was so satisfying to watch. The second condition was that Cody Rhodes had to beat Wardlow in a solid steel cage and this was the first ever steel cage match in AEW history. So this match had quite a lot of hype attached to it and it did not disappoint as Cody Rhodes picked up the win over Wardlow in a spectacular fashion by moonsaulting off the top of the steel cage. And this was absolutely insane to watch. Cody Rhodes legitimately broke his toe from moonsaulting off the top of the steel cage. But this was nothing in comparison to MJF's third and final condition. The third condition was that Cody Rhodes had to take 10 lashes on live TV and Cody Rhodes accepted. And MJF giving 10 lashes to Cody Rhodes was some of the most raw, captivating, yet hard to watch segments in AEW history. It was the kind of segment where you covered your eyes in agony for Cody Rhodes but ended up peeking through your fingers anyway because you wanted to see the brutality. Cody Rhodes was genuinely almost crying from the lashes that MJF gave him but could you blame him? I mean just hear the stinging sound of the leather on Cody Rhodes skin. Cody Rhodes back off this segment was an absolute mangled mess and just like that their match for revolution was on and this segment really solidified MJF and Cody's feud as arguably the best feud not only in AEW but possibly in the whole of wrestling at that time. And their feud culminated at AEW's revolution 2020 and this match was good but it was just that. Quite honestly it did not deliver on the massive hype they created with the storyline. Despite this though MJF got the W and he still had a boatload of momentum on side. That is until the pandemic happened. The pandemic managed to halt a lot of MJF's momentum as he appeared on the early pandemic episodes mainly as a spectator with Sean Spears on the sidelines. MJF and Sean Spears' shtick was betting money on the matches that were going on and while this was entertaining and funny at times, it was a far cry from the bastard MJF that we had grown accustomed to before the pandemic started. And at AEW's Double or Nothing 2020, he faced off against Jungle Boy Jack Perry and this match had barely any build but but despite that, this match was one of the sleeper hits of 2020. Jungle Boy and MJF absolutely killed it and I'm sure that if it was in front of a jam packed crowd, it would have amplified the general perception of the match. But MJF wrestled so well in this match, it was almost like he wanted to prove all the critics of his match at AEW's revolution with Cody Rhodes wrong. And MJF ended up picking up the win. After this though, MJF entered into a feud with the AEW world champion at that time, John Moxley. And to kick off this feud, MJF had a presidential like campaign to be the next AEW 
the world champion. And this campaign coincided with the actual American 2020 elections. The state of AEW address promo that MJF cut was pure gold and it really further solidified how talented MJF was on the mic and it showed that promos come naturally to MJF. In this promo, MJF called John Moxley a dictator and he called for change at the wheel of AEW because John Moxley was hogging the spotlight for himself. This promo highlighted MJF's brilliant orating skills and established that he does not miss when it comes to promos. This mother don't miss. No, he's f***ing good. That motherfucker don't miss, man. He's good. Two weeks later, MJF was attacked by John Moxley and Moxley gave him a paradigm shift of which MJF sold like a million bucks. And this caused MJF and his lawyer to propose that John Moxley not be allowed to use the paradigm shift at AEW All Out in their match, which was met with some resistance by John Moxley, but Moxley ultimately agreed and this set up their match at AEW's All Out 2020. This match was really good and MJF attempted to cheat but failed and while the rest backwards turn, this led to John Moxley hitting the paradigm shift on MJF. For the 1-2-3. MJF's feud with John Moxley really highlighted how precocious and ready for the main event scene MJF truly was. MJF was so good in this feud that I wouldn't have even minded if he beat John Moxley and became the new AEW World Champion at All Out because he more than proved that once he has the ball, boy can he run with it. After All Out, MJF started cozying up to Chris Jericho in an effort to get into Chris Jericho's faction, the inner circle. Chris Jericho was resistant but still engaged in playful banter with MJF and they were caught in a cycle of competitiveness, constantly trying to outdo each other in little ways but in a friendly and masculine way. And this was a way for them to move past their differences. And in a segment, this caused them to break out in song and dance, performing the song, Me and My Shadow. And this was an insane moment, purely for how outside of the box it truly was. Fans watching from home were not accustomed to this type of outlandish, unorthodox form of storytelling, especially on a wrestling show so needless to say a lot of people hated this segment but a lot more people loved than hated Chris Jericho and MJF's impromptu song and dance routine. MJF and Chris Jericho's performance was even in the New York Times best performances of 2020 so clearly this segment caused a lot of eyes to be on AEW. This segment truly highlighted what makes AEW so special as this was proof that they are not afraid to think outside of the box and they are willing to take risks and put out something that may be polarizing and could go horribly wrong. Despite the success of this, Chris Jericho was still reluctant to let MJF into the inner circle. So MJF showered him with gifts and MJF got Chris Jericho a portrait of himself accompanied by a clown. But Chris Jericho doesn't like clowns, so he Judas affected the crap out of that clown. <laughs> Chris Jericho was still reluctant to let MJF into the inner circle, so he proposed that if MJF could beat him at AEW's Full Gear 2020, then he would let MJF into the inner circle and this set up their match at AEW Full Gear. And this match was good and MJF picked up the win over Chris Jericho and this caused MJF and his right hand man Warlow to join the inner circle. And after this match, MJF won the Dynamite Dozen Ring for the second year in a row in a win over Orange Cassidy. But besides that, the bromance between Chris Jericho and MJF was in full effect as the inner circle went to Las Vegas and this Las Vegas trip highlighted how much the members of the inner circle did not like the new additions to the group, especially Sammy Guevara who did not like MJF. But nonetheless, the group still had an eventful time in Vegas and the next morning they were awakened by a crying hornswoggle in a diaper. And after this, MJF and Chris Jericho made themselves into a tag team and they entered into a feud with the AEW tag team champions at the time, the Young Bucks. And MJF and Chris Jericho made a personal one week with the Young Bucks when they attacked the Young Bucks father, Papa Buck and left him a bloody mess and the Young Bucks were very pissed about this and their feud culminated at AEW's Revolution 2021 for the AEW World Tag Team Championships and this was a great match but MJF and Chris Jericho unfortunately took the loss in this match. But ever since MJF joined the inner circle, he had been planting seeds of disorder in the inner circle and this caused Sammy Guevara to lash out and leave the inner circle and he tried to even make the other members of the inner circle turn on Chris Jericho but then Sammy Guevara turned and in a turn of events, they all instead turned on MJF. But MJF is very smart and he was a few steps ahead of them. And as the inner circle were about to beat up MJF, the lights went out and Sean Spears, FTR and Wardlow, along with Tully Blanchard, were revealed and they proceeded to massacre the members of the inner circle. And thus the pinnacle was born. AEW has always had a soft spot for factions and finally one of AEW's biggest and brightest stars was a part of a faction. And the pinnacle was straight money. 
as seemingly overnight they became the hottest faction in wrestling. Due to this betrayal, the inner circle wanted to kill the pinnacle and their intense beef culminated in a blood and guts match, which is a war game style match in a two sided cage where there are no pinfalls and the only way to win the match is through submission or through surrendering. And this match had a lot of hype going into it. And these 10 men made sure that the match lived up to the hype as it was every bit as bloody and barbaric as everybody had expected. And MJF picked up the win for the pinnacle when he threw Chris Jericho off the top of the steel cage. But this finish upset a lot of people on the internet because they felt that Chris Jericho's landing was a little bit too soft. But despite this, MJF closed out AEW's first ever number one cable ranked show in a crimson mask and this really established MJF as not a star of the future but a star of the present. And this feud then continued in a stadium stampede match at AEW's Double or Nothing with the stipulation that if the inner circle lost then they would have to disband. And this match started off as cinematic but then transitioned into a real match and this was most likely symbolic of the transition from pandemic wrestling to post pandemic wrestling. The inner circle ended up picking up the win and to be honest, this was the perfect time for MJF and Chris Jericho's feud to end. But no, the feud continued. Chris Jericho was determined to get a singles victory over MJF. So MJF proposed the five labors of Jericho, which meant that Chris Jericho had to beat four people of MJF's choosing if he wanted to wrestle against the fifth labor, MJF. The first labor was Sean Spears, of which Jericho defeated. The second labor was the king of the death match, Nick F Gage, of which Jericho defeated. But honestly, this should have been the labor before MJF for how brutal and bloody this match was. But anyway, the third labor was WCW legend Juventud Guerrero, of which Chris Jericho defeated. The fourth labor was Wardlow, of which Chris Jericho defeated. But then came the fifth labor, MJF, and MJF picked up the win over Chris Jericho in this match. And once again, AEW should have ended this feud here, but no they didn't. And then Chris Jericho then challenged MJF to a match at AEW's All Out 2021. And the stipulation going into this match was if Chris Jericho loses to MJF, then Chris Jericho will have to retire. And this set up their match at AEW's All Out 2021. And this was a good match in which Chris Jericho picked up the win over MJF in a very, very screwy finish. To be honest, this match should not have happened because it did no good to MJF having a loss against his name from Chris Jericho, considering the fact that this was the second loss that MJF has ever ever taken an AEW. And then after this, MJF entered into a feud with Darby Allen, and this feud was basically the story of a bully versus an outcast. But once again, MJF took it too far by bringing up the time when Darby was 5 years old, and he hopped in a car with his drunken uncle, and they got into a car crash, and his uncle died. And MJF said that Darby was the one who should have died. That was just too far. You didn't say that. Tell me. You did not just say that. But MJF's and Darby Allen's feud culminated at AEW's full gear with MJF picking up the win. And after this, and at this present moment, MJF is currently feuding with the cult of personality, CM Punk. And this was the feud that everybody was waiting for. As once upon a time when MJF was a child, he was a massive fan of CM Punk, and he even took a picture with him. And their first standoff did not disappoint as the two traded burn for burn, as CM Punk called MJF a less famous Miz. Ouch. I came to I play. Came to play. There's a price to pay. Tough for you to get down on your knees. I came to play. But despite the zinger, to be honest, MJF kind of owns CM Punk for the rest of the segment, as he compared him to John Cena and called him PG Punk. And this is testament to how great MJF truly is. And it's very exciting to see where this feud goes. And that's where we are in the story so far of MJF. Usually at the end of these videos, I go on a mushy monologue about said wrestler, but f MJF. And I mean that in the most loving possible way. He quite honestly deserves to be the AEW World Champion and will probably carry AEW on his back for many, many years. Thank you for watching the video. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. But anyway, goodbye, you jobbers.